I'm currently a cybersecurity instructor, instructor at LSU, and I've also co-founded a public safety software company that also does some cybersecurity, and I'm also a former software dev. And my name is Rafaela Mechig. I also recently got my master's degree from in computer science from Louisiana State University, where I now work as a researcher with the Applied Cybersecurity Lab. And in the past, I've also done, I was, I worked as a cybersecurity analyst for a handful of companies. All right, so for our research motivation and importance, as the name of this talk implies, our research largely focused on malware. Um, everyone here is aware of how destructive and costly malware can be, but it only continues to become more so. The average data breach now comes at a cost of more than $4 million to the company, and ransomware earnings last year were in excess of $600 million. So despite the obvious impact and cost of malware, um, we haven't seen very much technical research in this space on Apple Silicon. Um, so uh, this is also despite the fact that um, we've seen in the wild actual binaries compiled with code for M1 with just one such strain infecting over 30,000 Mac OS endpoints. So it's also important to look at new technology through the lens of an attacker. Um, so considering known uh, techniques as well as already compiled malware that may be able to be reused thanks to Rosetta 2. Um, ARM64 considerations such as needing to update your dependencies to ARM64 as well as your code, um, needing to validly sign in order to run ARM64 slices at all, uh, and then also needing an ARM64 machine, so Apple Silicon, to actually debug those code slices may actually make it preferable for malware authors to stay on Rosetta 2 or stay on Intel and just let Rosetta 2 handle the translation itself. Um, so assuming that malicious actors can and will use Rosetta 2 to their benefit, it's also important to identify novel forensics artifacts that incident responders may be able to use in an incident to figure out what malware ran, um, when it ran, and even you know how it ran, whether or not it ran through Rosetta 2. Um, so a final motivation related to this research was uh, the nature of the APIs chosen. So spyware has obvious privacy implications, and memory-only malware continues to be difficult to detect, even for forensics analysts. Um, and it's also important to look specifically at malicious capabilities associated with user land, um, rather than just the, the kernel level capabilities that often overshadow uh, user land in the research. So now we're gonna dive a little bit into the background uh, that's required to understand some of the work that we did. And we're gonna start off with what exactly is Apple Silicon? So in late 2020, Apple announced that they were gonna start rolling out their own processors, which at the time it was the M1. So the M1, is a system on a chip. So not only does it contain your CPU, it also contains your GPU, your universal memory, uh, secure enclave, and all of those components integrated within a single chip. Now, a lot of, uh, one of the biggest changes that they announced that came with the M1 was that they were changing the architecture from Intel x86-64 to into ARM64. Now, this is not the first time that Apple has announced that they were going to switch architectures. So in 2006, they announced that they were switching away from in PowerPC into Intel architecture. And then from Intel, now, now in 2020, they announced that they're switching away from Intel to ARM. Now, the thing about changing your CPU architecture is that all of the software that is able to run on that architecture will not be able to run on the new architecture because when you change the CPU, you're changing the entire instruction set with which that CPU is able to run that, that software. And so, I'm not a business expert, but telling your entire customer base that the software that they've spent thousands of dollars on will not be able to run on future iterations of your product, it's not a very good business model, right? So, with that in mind, Apple decided to uh, make sure that there was some compatibility after they transition into the new architecture for a couple of reasons. So this would allow some time for concurrent software developers uh, to roll out 
uh, native applications and adapt to the new architecture. But the, having Rosetta, it would allow to, for software that relies on older dependencies to still run, right? So there are essentially two main ways that you can run um, Intel uh, code on the DM1. So you have universal binaries and you have Rosetta 2. With the universal binaries, so a universal binary is, is Apple's version of a fat binary which contains compiled code for two different architectures in this case, and which gets com combined into a single binary. And then at runtime, the operating system will decide which uh, code slice to run depending on the uh, whichever matches closely the architecture. So one thing that can be noted is that with the universal binaries, you can actually, even though you're running it on M1, you can default, you can force the execution of the Intel slice, and some scripts will only, uh, will already just straight default to Rosetta 2. Now with Rosetta 2, um, that's the other way that you can run Intel binaries, and what exactly is it? So Rosetta 2 is a dynamic binary translator. So whenever, what that means is that whenever you run an Intel binary for the first time, it will be translated into ARM that's going to generate a new ARM equivalent binary, and which is our .aot files. So these AOT files, they will be stored in a specific folder that is protected by system integrity protection, which means that even if you have root access, you're not able to um, see this, uh, this directory. So you would have to reboot the machine and disable SIP and then uh, reboot it so they, then you can actually access the directory. Another thing about Rosetta is that it does not come pre-installed. So whenever you try to run an Intel binary for the first time, you'll get a prompt asking for you to install it and then you'll never be prompted again. And lastly, Rosetta is capable of translating most Intel-based apps with the exception of virtualization software or kernel extensions. Here we have uh, two screenshots of what the um, OAH directory, which contains all your AOT files, looks like. So we disabled SIP and we were able to view all these files. So at the top, we have the top level directory of the OAH, where we have a directory at the top with, um, uh, with all the numbers in there. Those contain subdirectories which contain your AOT files. And then we have an OAH version uh, file which contains Rosetta runtime um, information. And then at the bottom, we uh, access that, that other directory and you can see all the subdirectories that contain your AOT files. And then here we have a test program. So this is the VM map output, which is ex it's the equivalent of, of proc map on Windows. If you're familiar with it, this shows the process mappings in memory. So you can see um, we ran a test program that was compiled for Intel. And you can see all the references to the AOT file, to the AOT file in memory and also to the Rosetta um, engine running as well. All right, so getting into some of the previous work that's been done in this space, the work that most closely relates to ours is that that was done by Ko Nakagawa, um, where he was examining Rosetta 2 and specifically looking at it for potential exploitation. Um, so while he was doing that, he ended up reversing the Rosetta 2 runtime binary, detailing how to um, debug the emulation process at the ARM64 level, as well as patching Ghidra to actually correctly disassemble AOT files where it did not before. Um, the Corellium research team was able to get Linux running on M1 chips. In order to do this, they had to understand and implement a lot of the, uh, the sort of hardware programming chips or tricks that were used on Apple Silicon. So for example, uh, the custom interrupt routing that Apple uses for their Apple Silicon chips needed to be implemented in the Linux kernel by the Corellium team in order to actually make this work properly. Um, so ZekOps was able to exploit M1s using a historically vulnerable um, ARM-based IOKit driver uh, that was included on M1s uh, and essentially led to a race condition being possible that led to exploitation. Um, so over the years, there's been a lot of great uh, 
analysis of Mac malware binaries uh, done on, on Intel. Uh, most notably would be Patrick Wardle and his uh, security blog, um, Objective C, his book, uh, The Art of Mac Malware, and then his security conference that happens yearly, Objective by the C, that are all largely on Mac security and Mac malware. So looking at malware analysis on Apple Silicon binaries specifically, um, as the number of samples grows in this space, we're going to see more and more reports coming out. Some of the notable ones uh, are Red Canary exposing and detailing Silver Sparrow, which was that Mac sample that I mentioned earlier that infected over 30,000 Mac OS endpoints that had an M1 uh, binary within it. Google's threat analysis group looking at CDDS, which was, uh, was essentially a watering hole campaign um, attacking pro-democracy Hong Kong websites uh, that also included an M1 binary that they detailed. And then Patrick Wardle analyzing Go Search 2022, or 22, um, where he was looking at the anti-analysis arm logic associated with that M1 binary. So moving into our analysis goals, we had two main analysis goals that we were attempting to accomplish. We wanted to test uh, which Intel compiled samples would still work on the M1 and analyze those that did not go correctly and see if it was because of Rosetta 2. And then we also wanted to look specifically at uh, specific APIs within the Objective-C API to see if they were still going to work through Rosetta 2 and how they would work. So starting with uh, running Intel binaries on M1 and on Apple Silicon. So the environment that we used, uh, that we set up in order to do this was using Parallels. So that was the virtualization software we used. There was essentially no virtualization software that had support other than Parallels. So VMware wasn't an option, uh, nor were any other products. Um, so Parallels is what we went with. Uh, the VMs were Mac OS Monterey 12.2. Uh, a couple notable things about them is that snapshots were not a feature and still are not a feature with their M1 uh, VMs. So if you've ever done any malware analysis, especially dynamic analysis, you can imagine how much fun that was uh, to deal with. Um, another notable thing is that SIP had to remain enabled. Uh, so in order to disable SIP, you need to boot into recovery mode and do it from recovery mode but there's no way to modify the config options or the boot config order uh, associated with M1 VMs on parallels. Or well, that's actually not true. You could do it, but you would need to modify system files to do it, so you would need SIP to be disabled. So there's like a really nice catch-22 there that just makes it not possible. Um, but there was only one uh, sample that we tested that actually was affected by this, and I'll go into a little bit more about what I did there. Um, and then the host was a Mac OS Monterey 12.2, and then the one sample that was infect or was affected by system integrity protection remaining enabled uh, was actually run on a 12.1 Mac OS host that just had networking totally disabled. Um, all of the VMs were pre-installed with Rosetta 2 command line developer tools uh, and Wireshark, Rosetta 2 for obvious reasons, command line developer tools because a lot of the, the malware relied on functionality from those, and then Wireshark to perform some, some network analysis. And then the way the networks were set up, uh, so Parallels has three main networking modes. Uh, host only network is the only option that actually allows you to isolate the VM and take it offline um, and have it be basically within its own subnet. Um, so that was the mode that we went with. Uh, it also served its own DNS, which was not ideal, but still allowed us to view the DNS queries that were going to be coming out of the malware. The, the classic way to actually set this up is to have multiple VMs within one like VM net on uh, VMware, where you would have one of them acting as the DNS for the other. So you would have like INET SEM or something running, so that whenever the malware made connectivity pings, it would get 200 back, get 200s OKs back, and the malware would continue with whatever functionality it was going to do. Um, any attempts at that only resulted in frustration on parallels with M1. Uh, so the the best we could do was having observing DNS queries, but having those connectivity pings ultimately fail 
the malware ending its functionality uh, there. So moving into the malware selection, the criteria related to it, um, how functionality was determined, and where we ultimately got the malware. Um, so the first and foremost thing we were looking for was clear indicators of compromise. So uh, you know either C2 or other connectivity pings coming out of the malware, launch agents or other persistence mechanisms. So launch agents are uh, the most common persistent mechanism on Mac OS. Uh, they can be used for anything from uh, watching a directory and then whenever that directory's contents change, something happens, or having set intervals on which a job runs, or even every time a user logs in, uh, a script is run. So launch agents are, are really popular for persistence there, and we, we see a couple of those with the samples tested. Um, and then information harvesting, so any credential harvesting, looking for passwords, looking for running processes, any enumeration of that in text files that would then be exfiltrated out, all, all things of that nature fall under the information harvesting umbrella for us. Recency was also considered, so CDDS, which was the one that was analyzed by Google's Threat Analysis Group, is one of the samples we tested that had both a 2021 and a 2019 installer associated with it. The 2021 version was what was tested. Um, the impact level associated with it, so Silver Sparrow, the one that affected 30,000 Mac OS endpoints was an obvious one there. Uh, and then we also wanted to look at the viability of the attack vector. We wanted these to be attacks that still posed a real threat to even M1 users so that if Rosetta 2 were functional and did translate this malware, it would be a real viable attack vector that uh, M1 users could be infected by this Intel-based malware. So what we get when we add all of that up is um, recent high impact malware that can actually affect M1 users today. Um, about 150 sam samples were looked at and only 16 were determined to be uh, a part of our testing from that 150. So we tried to be selective, we tried to pick good samples. Um, and then the functionality that was determined was just using the IOCs that we mentioned um, and there's a little bit of a caveat there that without too much help, uh, I'll get into some specific samples and, and the ones that we determined were non-functional and, and how I determined that. Uh, and then all of the samples that we used were obtained from Objective-C. The Objective-C blog maintains a repository of malware. Uh, so if you see any of these samples and you're curious to, to try them out yourself or you know pick them apart, see how they work, uh, that, that repository is a very good source and, and we'll have all of our samples discussed. So looking at the security mechanisms for Mac OS, this is useful because in part the results that we report on uh, are what security mechanisms all of the malware encountered. Um, so briefly looking through them with file quarantine, essentially the way that the flow works for that is uh, when you download a file from the internet, Apple marks it with the com.apple.quarantine flag and then any file that has that flag, when it's run for the first time, uh, essentially a dialog bo box pops up. It's probably one you've seen before. This file was downloaded from the internet. Are you sure you want to run it? You click yes, the flag is removed, and it runs. Um, this is often pretty easy for uh, malware to get around if the initial stage is already on there because using like other uh, FTP protocols or um, even curl is, is simple enough to get around that quarantine flag. Uh, so anything that comes in with curl or another protocol is gonna not pick up that quarantine flag and be able to run straight away without user interaction. So Gatekeeper was the next one that they tried uh, since you know file quarantine ended up not quite being enough. With Gatekeeper, uh, the idea was that only developers that were validly signed by Apple would be able to run their software on a Mac without any user interaction. Um, so the thing about user interaction though is that social engineering is easy enough. You can ultimately get users to override those checkboxes easily enough. And developer IDs ended up being easy enough to obtain illicitly. Uh, so they introduced notarization as a third mechanism where when the apps are notarized, uh, they're only gonna be notarized when they pass checks related to uh, malicious content being a part of a binary or uh, code signing, so actually having a valid signature associated with Gatekeeper. And if you pass both of those, you're considered notarized and again, can run without user interaction. 
Um, but unnotarized apps, like with file quarantine, are going to result in a dialog box asking the user if they're sure they want to run that application because essentially Apple can't guarantee your security there. Um, and the final one that sort of has been developed while all of these three mechanisms were being introduced over time was their XProtect malware protection mechanism. So it uses Yara scanning, essentially just looking for um, known malware that's going to be a part of like the XProtect sets of Yara signatures. Uh, so it's not going to detect novel malware. Um, and we'll see in a little bit the results that uh, it actually doesn't do a great job of detecting even years old malware. And it also can be overridden for applications via a checkbox. Um, but for executables or other file types, it's actually going to need system integrity protection disabled and to be disabled altogether through the command line. So looking at the malware and uh, what was determined as functional or non-functional and initially looking at the security mechanisms. So the first thing to note is that 11 out of 16 were functional, um, basically out of the box. And we'll get into the specific behaviors that made them functional. Um, but they would encounter one, maybe two of those security mechanisms that required interacting with the dialog box and then would work. So they were essentially one social engineering campaign from working. Um, the next thing to note is that with malware protection, all of the samples tested when they were tested at the time uh, were um, at least three months old, but only five out of 16 samples were actually fingerprinted by XProtect as malware. And as mentioned in the, the obtaining and selection of the malware, these were all high impact samples that were very notable for their time. So it was interesting to see only five out of 16 be picked up by XProtect. Um, so looking at the specific non-functional ones and whether or not uh, Rosetta 2 was the culprit there. Uh, so Apple Juice slash Mac Loader, uh, its initial stage was caught by Gatekeeper and then its second and third stage didn't deploy at all even after allowing it through uh, Gatekeeper. So it needed to actually have its, uh, its file extensions changed and then given executable permissions and then eventually ultimately ran um, and functioned technically through Rosetta 2, but it was non-viable to the point that it was put in the, the non-functional malware. And you'll see that as a trend with these uh, that are part of the non-functional malware. Um, all of them, except for Crisis, could have made it into the functional malware category if it were not for that viability category, um, which means that 15 out of 16 samples essentially functioned through Rosetta 2. Uh, and so the 11 out of 16 that we're looking on the left side are not just ones that Rosetta 2 allowed to function, but ones that were so effective that they actually are viable even on M1 systems and will work straight away. Um, so moving on to Crisis, the reason that that one didn't work was simple enough. It was an i386 executable, so it was 32-bit Intel, and Rosetta 2 doesn't translate 32-bit Intel. Schleyer uh, relied on a zero day that was patched at the time of uh, the OS I was running. So it didn't work as far as its infection mechanisms, but it did run properly through Rosetta 2. Um, Silver Sparrow was that 30,000 macOS endpoint sample. That one um, on Rosetta 2 actually did fail related to an installation that was associated with uh, JavaScript. Um, so I thought maybe that this one actually was not functioning through Rosetta 2. But I looked at the UDP stream for both the ARM64 and the x86 slice associated with the installer. Um, and it was the exact same for both. It failed in the same spot. So that means that if it was running the same and failing the same on the ARM64 slice and the x86 slice, that Rosetta 2 was not the culprit um, because it ran the same on both. And then finally looking at SysJoker. That one, uh, again, was one that needed its extension changed, needed executable permissions, uh, and then also had a mechanism associated with it that it needed to, um, needed, be, needed bypassing. Um, so an individual end user is not going to change the extension, give executable permissions, and then also ignore security mechanisms. So again, it was non-viable as an attack, but did function through Rosetta 2. So Rosetta 2 is more than happy to, to make malware functional. So looking at the specific Xavier behavior observed in some of these samples, uh, so again, we were looking for launch agents or daemons and uh, some secondary binaries we also saw with, with one sample like Ventir, 
that we're watching for killed processes and would restart them. So that's the persistence we're looking for. Networking, again, was any connection attempts, either to C2 or to just like Google.com. And then harvesting, again, credentials, key logging, uh, screen recording, keychain dumps. So we saw at least one of these mechanisms with all of these 11 samples. And again, even with some of the ones that didn't make the cutoff for actually functional and viable, Rosetta 2 was more than happy to make possible. The reason there's a question mark related to Evil Quest's networking is because that was the sample that was run on the host OS where networking was totally disabled. So I wasn't even really able to look at what uh, connection attempts were ultimately coming back from, from DNS or anything. Uh, but the belief based on other functionality associated with Evil Quest that you'll see in a little bit is that its networking would have worked. It would have made a connection out to, to C2. So looking at an example of a launch agent, uh, we're looking at CDDS here, which is the one that targeted those pro-democracy Hong Kong websites. Hopefully you all can see that. Um, but what we have here is the XML file, essentially a config file for how the, uh, the user agent, so the launch agent here, is going to run. Um, we have the program arguments, and the program arguments, first it's going to be the, like the argv0 is going to be the actual executable itself, and then um, any flags, behavioral flags associated with it. So run mode if needed is also what comes along with that. And then we see the user agent actually functioning in, in PSOX uh, with those, those flags run mode if needed. So looking next at Mac Downloader, which was another one. This is an example of uh, a credential harvesting malware that we saw run. Um, so we can see here it's got the, the root username and password. It acquired those via a fake uh, prompt associated with your credentials for Adobe Air. This was uh, masquerading as a fake Adobe installer, which is a favorite among malware. Um, so it got that username and password. And then after that, where the keychains were located, got some networking information and then even what applications and processes were running. So uh, doing a lot of reconnaissance. And then this config file was attempted to be exfiltrated back out. Uh, we saw in the, the Wireshark logs. Um, and then looking at EvilQuest. Uh, so this one was interesting. It also had a user agent, or it also had a launch agent. Um, and it also actually killed a process named Avast, so it looks for any keywords associated with any antivirus and looks to kill those processes. And then a final thing that it did that we saw was it went through um, essentially the directories surrounding it looking for any other executables that it then actually infected. So it hollowed out and created uh, essentially a space for itself within the process. And then it adds uh, a marker for itself at the end, so dead face. Um, so because it's, uh, it's little endian, the most significant byte is at the end. So we see dead face in reverse here, actually. Um, but yeah, Evil Quest was very interesting and presented a lot of functionality. So moving into the discussion for that, some of the assertions we can make based off this particular part of the research, uh, we can say without a doubt that Rosetta 2 will translate malware and that none of the malware that malfunctioned or was non-viable was really because of Rosetta 2, except for Crisis being I386. But we know that 32-bit uh, is not going to be translated um, just from the documentation. So that's not really Rosetta 2's responsibility. So that wasn't Rosetta 2 malfunctioning. Um, the infection viability associated with Intel samples on M1. Xprotect missed most of the samples, despite some being around for over five years. Um, the, the trade-off there is that most infections on Mac OS will require user interaction with the malware. So we saw basically at least one security mechanism being triggered by each of those. Uh, but you all know as well as I do that there are many potent ways to get a user to infect themselves when all that stands in the way is one are you sure dialog box. And then the, the final takeaway is that signing validly, requiring an M1 or an M2 to debug ARM64 slices and needing to rebuild all code modules for ARM64 may actually leave Rosetta 2 preferable to modernizing. Uh, and sort of the, the case study to really drive this one home is Zuru. So Zuru was one malware that we looked at. Uh, essentially, it was masquerading as iTerm2 as a binary. Um, so iTerm2 is a very popular, essentially, terminal emulator for, uh, for Macs. And it not only made a perfect copy of that, that also had remote code execution capabilities, 
um, as well as downloading capabilities. Uh, they actually paid to become the number one search result on Baidu. So they appeared even above the legitimate iTerm2 with their perfect copy, uh, and then essentially face planted and didn't work on any M1s. So what I think about when I think of like the bad guy HQ associated with Zuru is Zuguru going over his, uh, his evil plan and it's, you know, create a perfect copy of iTerm2, appear as the number one search result, even above the legitimate iTerm, and then it crashes on every M1. Um, this is not a great result for an advanced persistent threat. <laughs> so uh, the, there's a very real possibility that just sticking as a malware author to Intel binaries and letting Rosetta 2 translate everything for you and handle all of the headache for you uh, is going to be preferable to modernizing and uh, you know actually having to figure out M1s and M2s yourself. Okay, now we're moving on to the second part of the project that we worked on. So this part focuses more on actually isolating some of the APIs that were used by this mal some of this malware that we talked about. And what we need to know is that APIs, they are commonly used in macOS development. More specifically, we're going to be looking at the Objective-C API. And the thing about them is that they provide a very convenient and easy way for you to interact with system resources and for you to get system information at runtime, which is a pretty good feature for a programmer. However, that ease of access is very appealing to malware, malware authors as well, so it gets pretty commonly abused by uh, Mac OS malware. So our goal here is to write some proof of concept programs that mimic malware behavior so that we can check if these APIs that often get abused um, still work as, it, as expected and what other system behavior do they trigger. So our setup for this was that all of the programs, um, they were compiled uh, using Xcode on in, an Intel MacBook Pro. And we then took those programs and ran them on our 24 inch M1 Mac, and which was running uh, Mac OS Monterey 12.1 at the time. And the APIs that we selected were uh, pulled from a research paper that was published uh, last summer that uh, also looked at some of this malware and compiled a list of APIs that uh, were uh, largely abused um, by Mac OS malware. So here is a, an overview of the APIs that we're going to be looking at. So they kind of range for, they do different things. So we have key loggers, we have uh, some of them launch executables, some of them will allow you to get system information, uh, run scripts, and uh, memory only execution, as well as clipboard monitoring. So we're gonna start off with our key loggers. So a key logger essentially uh, is a program that captures uh, user input, it's more specifically like keystrokes and, and mouse clicks. And more often than not, when used maliciously, um, they try to, uh, they run without the user's knowledge or consent. So we are looking at um, APIs from two different uh, classes. So we're looking at the AppKit framework and we're looking at the Core Graphics framework. And um, one thing that was interesting about the key loggers was that um, key logger, the using, capturing user keystrokes is a part of Apple's accessibility features, which uh, you cannot, every time uh, a program uses it, you will trigger an accessibility prompt, as you can see here on the right. And this actually impacted how uh, one of these programs ran. So to, to demonstrate that, um, here we have a screenshot. So at the very top of the screenshot, we have, um, we can check that we're actually using a, a Mako 64 bit uh, for x86 uh, x binary, um, which is our Intel binary. And then when we run this, at first we, we ran it with um, our accessibility disabled, as you can see for our accessibility check here. So the idea with this program was to, whenever I press a, a, a key on, on, on my keyboard, it should be able to, uh, it should be printed out back onto the terminal. But as you can see um, here at the bottom, it only, it's only showing my, my terminal input. It's not 
uh, piping back out. So once we enabled that accessibility permission, um, we can see what the expected output uh, was here. So it's kind of hidden here in, in the very corner, but you can see my, uh, you can see the, the letters that I'm typing hello here, and then it immediately gets printed back out onto um, the terminal as it was expected. And then here, just to double check, uh, we have our VM map as well, and where you can see uh, the same references to the um, AOT files for that, that Intel binary, as well as other references to the Rosetta runtime. Here we have our other, our second uh, keylogger, where we're looking at the CG event tap. And this one was a different keylogger where we're actually trying to output it to a file that's on my desktop. So um, you can see the program execution on the left where you have um, a very nice keyboard smash over there. And then, hello, my name is Rafaela, uh, new line. This is logging me, new line. And then I press control C to try to exit the, the execution. And then you can see, um, hopefully, on the screenshot on the right, that is our key log file. And you can see this, you can see that with this API in particular, they not only captured the, my, um, the text that I wrote on the terminal, but they also captured the other keystrokes that I did with the new, for the new line, as well as the left control C. So you have the keyboard smash, return, or enter. Uh, hello, my name is Rafaela, return, this is logging me, return, enter, and the left control C as well. So this gets a lot more information from the user. Um, and then if you try to run it again, it'll pipe it to the same um, output file, and again, same level of detail. To verify this one, um, we ended up using a tool uh, by the Objective-C uh, Foundation that's available for download for free. Uh, which was created exactly uh, for this purpose, which is to monitor um, keyboard event taps. And here we can see that after, while our program is running, and we ran uh, rekey, uh, you can see that our, you can find, easily find our keyboard at the very, um, at the very top, and we have the, um, that the filter is active. So moving on to our next class, we have launching executables. Um, so malware will often try to launch executables to you know, um, try to sometimes they'll want to check the environment that they're in and, and request um, maybe contact a C2 instance and download the actual payload. So for example, Proton B try, uh, uses NS task launch, which we're going to look at to check for the process list and see uh, whether its persistence mechanism has already been installed and is actively running. And then we're also going to be looking at NS Apple script. Um, NS test launch, uh, this one was pretty straightforward. So we just wrote the program, called the API, and then we put it to sleep. So we're actually running the binary sleep. Um, and then you can see that we have successfully uh, ran the, um, we were able to launch the bin sleep um, as a sub-process of our NS test program. And then NS Apple Script was also pretty straightforward, where we also just launched call the API and we put the program to sleep long enough so we could get the VMware the sorry the VM map dump. And the interesting thing about this one is that since it's using um, Apple Script to uh, it, and it's being called from an Intel binary, you can see that even Apple Script is also running as an Intel um, as um, an Intel, and it's also being translated by Rosetta. So you can see with the arrows in the bottom right that you can find the references for the, a the Apple script AOT files. This is an interesting case. Uh, memory only execution, it's, this is a technique that's commonly used by modern malware techniques where it, um, it, they will try to load, so they will try to load the payload and leave it only in memory without ever really touching disk. So this provides them a, a really high degree of stealth and reduces the chain, the, their chances of detection. So for example, um, Apple Juice that we talked about actually uses this specific API that we're gonna walk, uh, talk about uh, to load the payload that they receive from the C2 instance. And this is a very common way to load uh, code in memory, uh, so much so that um, a couple months after we did this work, uh, Patrick Wardle uh, posted a tweet talking about this API that Apple actually this got so abused that Apple went in and changed the implementation of the API to temporarily write the payload that's going to be loaded into memory um, to a temporary uh, directory on disk. Uh, 
And uh, one last thing about this is that it can only load um, Apple bundle type applications, so any like dot app um, files. Then here we can see the execution of our program. So this program was also pretty straightforward. We created a, a dummy bundle um, and compiled that as well. So we're trying to open that file, get that file size, map that in memory, and then once that's mapped, we can create that object in memory at a specific load address, where, which we're checking the specific load address, print it out twice, and then I'm gonna point out the 1094db000, which is the address we're looking at. And at the very bottom, the VM map, we can check that um, at that exact same address, 1094db000, we have our bundle loaded. And then, last but not least, we have clipboard monitoring and copying. Um, this is commonly used by um, malware that's trying to steal your, your uh, credentials or trying to or steal your uh, wallet addresses if you do a lot of cryptocurrency stuff. So for example, if you use password managers, you're co constantly copying and pasting your credentials. Um, so uh, malware, if, if you have a piece of malware, they are able to read that from directly from your, your clipboard without your knowledge. And for, they are also able to write directly to your, your clipboard without your knowledge. Um, so for example, they could overwrite, if you're copying an address that you're, a uh, wallet address that you're trying to send some cryptocurrency to, you could technically overwrite it with a, a separate address that um, you don't want to send it to, right? For the malicious actor. So we're looking at NS Pasteboard here, which is a part of the app kit. And then this one is also pretty straightforward. We use the API to write to the clipboard and then we write it back from the clipboard at the very top. And then on the bottom left, we have the actual code for the program, just to show that like how simple it is. It's just like a couple lines of code. And then um, you can read, uh, write the hello world and then read it directly from the keyboard. And then we also can check that our hello world in the recent clipboard history. So after all that is done, uh, we go back to our OAH directory and sure enough, you can see that every single Intel binary that we ran has its own respective AOT file, um, which uh, could serve as indication that the the, the, that Intel binary um, was executed on the system. So in conclusion, we have, it's pretty safe to say that at this point, uh, functionality of Intel malware on Apple Silicon is still largely complete, and it's not very difficult for you to still leverage the object of C API on Intel to run it on, um, on the M1. And you might ask, like, how long is, is this feature going to be available? We don't know how long Rosetta is going to stick around. It might be a lot longer, it might be a couple years, it might be a couple months, we don't know. Also, the Objective-C can, API can still very much be used for um, malicious purposes. Just write it in Intel and then run it on, on DM1. You, you're still guaranteed to, um, pretty much guaranteed to like for it to work. And then um, your AOT files, at the end of the day, they can serve to some degree as an indicator that an Intel compiled uh, program ran on your system. So for future work, uh, we also want to uh, continue understanding Rosetta better, both as a, an attack surface and as a source of forensic artifacts and information. There's a lot there that I think we just started uh, scratching the surface. Um, we also want to make sure, uh, we want to work out our lab environment for virtualization a little bit better so we can test uh, the, some of the malware functionality to its um, full capability. And we will also be retesting some of these, this research on M2s that just came in this past week, actually, and um, on Mac OS Ventura. All right, so thank you all for coming to our talk. Thank you so much for B-Sides for having us. And if you have any questions, um, I guess now is your time. Yeah, so project, so Project Champollion. Oh, could you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, sorry. So there, there, um, the question was that it seems that there's some a naming convention, it's some kind of SHA-256 uh, hash on, um, on the directory names. And um, I think according to Project Champollion, it seems to be a SHA based on like the file contents and the path that it executed on. 
Um, I haven't seen any other references to that, but um, that was the only reference that I have seen. So that's, it, it seems to be a, a, a hash of something of the file for sure. I mean, that would depend on exactly the way that the, the antivirus or antivirus control was, okay. was working. Um, if it were looking in, you know, specific spaces and it hadn't updated for Rosetta 2, then obviously that would be the case. But if it was using, like, heuristics approach and looking for common things like APIs that are abused or whatever, then it would still see, because it does get translated to, you know, the M1 and Apple Silicon space, where assuming the antivirus was sufficiently comprehensive, it would still see all of that behavioral and heuristic uh, okay, type so information. That is not necessarily an enclave the way Google is. It's looking at looking on the instruction set is still available to be used by Google. Yeah, it's just an emulation process, and it's okay. actually still mapped, uh, like the VMF output showed, it's still mapped in the same space as the okay. that initial Intel binary getting executed. Um, so it's very much just a process that's running uh, with memory mappings that have both the AOT and the Intel associated with it. Oh, yeah, sure. Have we seen So, um, repeat the question. Oh, yeah. Have we seen any malware that um, uses both Rosetta and any native uh, capabilities? Um, I, yeah. From so. That's essentially what a universal or a fat binary would be, where it would have both the Intel capabilities and it would have it would have the Intel binary and it would have the M1 or M2 binary associated with it. Um, so a lot of the malware samples that we looked at that had M1 functionality were universal binaries because obviously they were Intel binaries initially, um, and then they were updated to also have some M1 capabilities. Um, so when you're talking about a fat binary, that has literally both of those code slices. So it's gonna have functionality for both, would be able to run on Intel, and would be able to run natively on M1 potentially. Um, so that would be a way that it would it sort of encompass both. As far as like specific Rosetta 2 functionality, Rosetta 2's purpose is to make Intel's essentially function exactly like their Apple Silicon counterparts. So there's no like specific functionality that any of them target where it's like it only existed maybe on the uh, Intel binaries because if it didn't exist on Apple Silicon, then it wouldn't be able to be translated and run in some capacity. Maybe it was a different API and it gets translated on Apple Silicon to a different API, but the functionality needs to exist on both where it's not possible for it to run on Apple Silicon. So there's no like, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if that answers your question. Yeah, so basically if, you, if you're running an Intel process, you're not, so Rosetta is going to the Intel will be in the Intel binary will be in memory only as long as it requires for Rosetta to um, tr actually translate and generate the AOT file. So the, the AOT file will contain the ARM, um, the ARM, the translated code, which is actually going to run, and that has and then it uses the data from the Intel binary. Uh, but the Intel binary is technically more there as like. A database, to my understanding, as opposed to a, actually, that's what the code that's running. If that, not sure if that helped out. Um, I think somebody a had a question. Yeah, I did. Um, so, have you seen any type of uh, evasion techniques for for using malware samples to try and avoid launching that gun install Rosetta pop up? Um, I have not seen anything that tried. Okay, so the question was, have we seen anything that tried to evade? having the prompt come up where you need to install Rosetta 2. I haven't seen anything that like tried to bundle the Rosetta 2 installer, trigger that to install Rosetta 2 itself, and then move on with its capabilities. Um, I haven't seen anything that tried to do that. Whether or not that's theoretically possible, I mean, you would still need to bypass other security mechanisms in order to make that happen. 
because you can't just run zero clicks without any user interaction and just have stuff install uh, and then go. So eventually you would encounter something. It would be a trade-off for either having the user have to install Rosetta 2 and maybe they Google Rosetta 2 and say, oh, that's a legitimate thing, I'll install that, versus a security mechanism popping up that's like, this program is trying to install this, Apple can't verify its security, are you sure you want to install it? Like, I would generally prefer to have the first pop-up be the one that pops up for me. Right. Um, yeah. but, but also, like, at that, at that same time, like, it only pops up for you once. So, like, once that Rosetta gets installed, it's, it's pretty much done, right? So if um, a user is already using one any question, software that question. is... Done. Done, done. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, if, okay. Yeah, if there is... If there, essentially, if there is one... Um, if Rosetta gets installed and the user already has an Intel software that still hasn't been adapted, like the company hasn't rolled out the native uh, application, then Rosetta will need that Rosetta will need to be installed for that to run. And so the user, the, the malware is able to run without any prompts. Okay, so that seems like the last question we were able to take. So again, thank you all for coming. If you have any specific questions, feel free to come up after. Um, but thank you all for coming out. Yep. Well, also, I'm also on Discord. On